Welcome to AgriLink's Video Notes. I'm Becky Manning from BFS. And today we have with us Jurgen Dreyer, who's going to be talking about the dairy value chain in Africa. Thank you, Becky. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. Could you, just to start out, could you give us a snapshot, if you would, about the dairy industry as it currently is in Africa? Um, I think uh, there's a growing population, specifically in East Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, the middle class is growing, mm -hmm. um, economically is going fairly well. The milk consumption, estimated by the International Dairy Federation, has gone up by 22% over the last uh, six years. Mm -hmm. um, this growing market has created a lot of interest from even the big global dairy processors that are now looking uh, into East Africa to invest there. I know, or at least I understand, that the majority of milk production uh, comes from smallholders. For, in Kenya, I believe it's 80% of the milk that's produced come from uh, dairy producers that own fewer than three, three heads of cattle. Um, what sort of um, challenges do these smallholders face in turning their dairy, which is used for subsistence, into an income-producing product? Um, the private sector interest that I mentioned before. Um, obviously, those big dairy processors, they want to focus on the large-scale farmers because they're looking for volumes. Mm -hmm. They're looking for, for quality of milk. Um, and we, as s &V, we are a development organization. We are looking to bridge that gap between the smallholder farmers and the dairy processors. Uh, we do that by, by providing training. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, for example, by uh, introducing quality-based milk payment systems, mm. whereby the smallholders, even though uh, they have very small quantities of milk, they still get paid for high-quality milk. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the large processors, and of course, in many of the countries in Africa, there are multinational, vertically integrated companies like Parmalat um, that have their own quality standards and they trade across border, which of course runs into other food safety standards. Mm -hmm. Could you speak how um, you help smallholders meet these often very stringent uh, food safety standards? Uh, yes. Um, often the milk, the dairy value chain in, in developing countries is, um, let's say, organized in a way that the smallholders are organized together into a cooperative um, that then sells the milk to uh, a processor. Now to introduce um, a quality based milk payment system uh, from processor to a cooperative is fairly easy but because those volumes are, are quite big and mm -hmm. they're easy to test uh, and the testing equipment is available and the scale, the, and the scale is, is good but to test the milk, uh, the small volumes of each farmer Let's say a, a milk can can contain milk from four different farmers. Mm -hmm. To test those small volume, that is a, that is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at uh, technology, uh, cheap testing methodologies, uh, but at the same time they have to be reliable uh, testing. Um, they have to be a reliable tests uh, because they they are being used for a, a quality based milk payment system. So people get, actually get paid right. um, based on those tests. Mm -hmm. Um, the dairy industry has many benefits that, that it can offer, economic support, obviously nutritional support, but there's a greenhouse gas issue and another climate issue, um, uh, the availability of water. It's a very uh, high water demand industry and the development of and water needed also as well for forage, uh, quality forage. Could you speak to those, those constraints and challenges? Yes, I can. Uh, as SMV, we've developed a um, solution we call Green Cows. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at uh, the greenhouse gas emission per liter of milk in sub-Saharan Africa is, is very high. It's around 9 kg of CO2 equivalent mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other parts of the world, this figure might be around 2 or 3 maybe. Uh, this is mainly due to inefficiency of the system. So. Uh, we are looking to provide support services uh, for the farmers. So it could be finance or, or input supply or um, information extension services, mm -hmm. um, veterinary services, um, but also by providing training. So to, to make sure those production systems are more efficient, uh, you can produce the same amount of milk with less cows, 
then your greenhouse gas emissions will go down quite a lot. Um, the other thing we're doing is um, bringing our biogas program uh, together with the dairy activities. Mm -hmm. We have quite large biogas programs in a number of countries and uh, the, the byproduct of the biogas is called slurry and that can be used again for, for example, commercial fodder production mm -hmm. um, in order to keep the nutrient cycles closed. Uh, the higher quality fodder and feed that you give the animal, the less emissions you have. So that's another important aspect that we are working on. Um, the last thing there is our use of other renewable energy sources mm -hmm. within the dairy value chain because there are a lot of um, uh, energy is needed in not only in, in collection, but cooling, but also in processing. So we're looking at all sorts of different technologies that will reduce the energy cost. Could you tell us more about the uh, impact on smallholders of the high quality forage? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, farmers are not always aware that this high quality uh, fodder is very beneficial to them. Uh, obviously, it has a higher cost as well. So we try to combine our, our efforts, not only to do fodder production, but at the same time provide specific training on, on animal feed and feeding strategies. So uh, the farmers can use the high quality fodder as efficient as possible. You mentioned um, the dairy value chain and, it's, it's, and green cows. So we've been talking primarily about cattle, but there are other dairy species, of course, that are um, found throughout the world, goats and camels being two predominant ones. Do you see those uh, species uh, joining the value chain and mm. benefiting from your approaches? Yeah, most of the processes are focusing on one species only. So it's mm. either, it's, let's say if it's cow milk, they don't really also process goat milk or camel milk. Mm. But um, um, based on, on climate change, um, I think more and more people are starting to keep camels mm. at the moment. Mm. And we see uh, SSV a big um, niche for camel milk and the, then the products. Um, it's often specifically uh, targeted towards a specific cultural groups that really like to drink camel milk and those can be in, in a country like Kenya but also abroad. Um. So for our final question, just sort of as a, as a summary, could you tell us what um, approaches that SNV has supported that have been particularly affected, effective for dairy producers? Um, particularly effective, I think, has been our, our training program. Mm -hmm. We focus a lot on, on skills development, uh, practical skills development, and we are establishing a network of training farms mm -hmm. um, whereby um, uh, some of the training farms actually make more money out of training than they do out of selling milk. Mm -hmm. So there is a big demand and people are ready to pay for those uh, services. Um, we're still looking at to develop certain business models for advisory services to mm -hmm. farmers, uh, which we believe have to be integrated with another sort of support service. Cannot be a standalone advisory service at this point because people are not ready to pay for that. But if we can combine it with an input supply, or mechanization, I think that we could come up with sustainable business models for that. Thank you, Jürgen, for joining us today at the AgriLinks video note. If you viewers um, find this topic of interest, you can find more resources on AgriLinks. Thanks again.